in the year 2014, I found myself clutching a tiny suitcase filled with meager belongings in one hand, and the hand of my six-year-old son in the other. These tiny possessions were all that remained of a life that I had built. The life that was not given to me on a silver platter, but the life that was the result of hard work, dedication, and strong determination to build something meaningful for myself and my family. As I looked down at my son, I saw different kinds of expressions. One of fear and uncertainty. That journey was not our choice. We had been forced to leave our home by the horrors of war. In that moment, in Donbass, Ukraine, we were confronted by armed men wearing balaclavas who had crossed the border from Russia and were determined to, claim, to lay claim to our land. Their agenda was clear, to steal our land and eliminate anyone who stood in their way. I still remember the click of the lock that echoed through my apartment, the final punctuation mark on the sentence of my time at home. That was our goodbye to the blue and yellow flag that was standing in a vase next to my son's bed. And as in a sentimental movie, we promised to it that one day we'll come back and there will be the time when we'll be waving Ukrainian colors freely and happily. But at that moment, my home was draped in a somber hues of blue, red and white, the palette that speaks of danger, violence and persecution. Leave, just to not be kidnapped or shot. Leave, just to not be targeted for your beliefs. It took me eight long years to build my new home in the free part of Ukraine. That tiny suitcase that I held in 2014 had been replaced by an abundance of belongings. Dozens of boxes with dishes, furniture and treasured mementos that can make a place feel like a home. But with all those comforts, never could I have imagined that the worst was yet to come. For every Ukrainian, the morning of the 24th of February 2022 was marked by a jarring awakening. For me, it was a shrill ring of phone call, my friend's voice on the other side of the line, and a chilling word echoing in my ears. Vina. War. She keeps telling me that she will definitely rewrite this memory, and one day she will call me back early in the morning with a completely different word, victory. And to be honest, I don't have any doubt. I'm sure it will happen. I can feel it in my bones. And do you want to know why I'm so certain that Ukraine will emerge victorious again, the terror brought by our neighboring country? It's just because of people. Countless individuals that I have met on my way, those who stand by my side and those who will enter my life in the future. These people are like angels, sent to guide me through the darkness and remind me of the goodness that still exists in this world. They give me hope. They make me believe that humanity is not lost and that kindness and love can conquer even the greatest of evils. There were battles raging in Gastomil, Bucha and Irpin, so close to the place that had become my home. Sounds of military jets, helicopters and explosions outside were like the scene of hell. I knew I had to act quickly, 
I had to pack my life into a tiny suitcase again, trying to fit eight years worth of memories. What part of your life would you pack in just 10 minutes? What are the most important items for you? Think about it. But then the announcement came. All the metro lines were closed. To reach the evacuation trains at the railway station, my son and I had to cross the bridge from the left bank of the Dnieper River to the right. But with most bridges closed, we had only one shot and one open bridge. I locked the door behind us, feeling sharp pain in my heart, that sound again. It was not deja vu, it was real. For hours we were trying to make our way out of the left bank. We walked towards the last open bridge. And as we walked, I was repeating a few instructions to my son, sounding like a broken record. One, if a bomb lands near us, fall down, face to the ground, arms on your neck, mouth open. Two, if I'm wounded, promise you will run and not be staying next to me. Three, memorize all the pin codes from the bank cards. Four numbers, tell me. The sun was setting and the fights were ongoing. My heart raced when I saw him stop the car. I noticed he was wearing a military uniform. He offered us a ride. A lifeline in the midst of Caius. The thing was, he had already evacuated his family outside Kiev and felt called to come back and fight for our land. I didn't ask his name. But since then, I have named him Angel in my mind. He was the first person who showed us kindness and compassion in the world that suddenly turned hostile. And I shuddered to think what would have happened if she hadn't stopped, if, she, if he hadn't given us a lift. Would we even be alive? Thanks to him, our story continued. We landed in Stockholm, our first time in a new country and under the circumstances that our minds couldn't even process. All we could do was to go with the flow and hope to be lucky enough to survive. It was dark and cold and I was holding a tiny suitcase in one hand and the hand of my 14 year old son in the other. As we approached the door, a woman opened it, having a tiny dog in her arms. We locked the eyes for the first time, though we knew each other's names, there was so much we didn't know. In the days that followed, I found myself wondering what had inspired her to open her doors to us two mentally wounded strangers from Ukraine. We grew closer to each other. Helena always respected our space and never intruded on our bubble, allowing us to gradually emerge from our mental shell. It may be hard to believe, but my first walks outside the house were no further than 100 meters. The next day, I went a little bit further, then further, until one day I felt strong enough to take the train. For me, she is a true role model. And I keep wondering what kind of inner strength she possesses to be so kind and giving. But at the same time, I have another question constantly playing on my mind. 
what would have happened if she hadn't opened us her doors? Are the Swedish nights in March too cold? I didn't dare to seek the answer. The scene at the migration office in Stockholm was a grim reminder of the human cost of war. A bit of coldness of the weather was only matched by chilling emotions of people standing in the line. Then I overheard the conversation between a man and a woman struggling to communicate. The man could speak only, the woman could speak only um, Ukrainian, but no English or Swedish, but the man could speak only them. I knew I had to help. For the next three hours, I was the interpreter trying to help them to understand each other. That was a tiny act of kindness that turned into something brighter than I could ever imagine. Two days later, the man reached out to me, wanting to do something good in return. He introduced me to two bright angels, Andres and Cecilia. They were determined to help. They launched an amazing initiative where nearly 100, nearly 100 newly arrived Ukrainians could connect with local professionals. And it was a lifeline to all of us that meant that we could walk further than 100 meters. That meant that we could feel included and that our lives were not over yet. That we could and would come back to a more or less normal life. I remember walking back after our first meeting, feeling like my wings were growing back again, despite being cut so abruptly. That was a feeling of hope that I thought I had lost forever. My Swedish suitcase started being packed with kindness, support, hope and help. And when you think of help, do not immediately jump to the idea of money. There is more than that. And when you meet a person with a similar hand luggage suitcase like mine, add your kind actions. Put some hope inside. Cure their cut wings. Give them the chance to believe that humanity is not lost. And do remember that your love and kindness can conquer even the greatest of evils. Thank you. Eva Ukraine.